Good afternoon and welcome to Sahara TV. Femi Odukbame is an award-winning filmmaker, writer and photographer who's written, directed and produced several documentaries, dramas and commercials. He's also the co-founder of I Represent Film Festival and the CEO of DV Works Studios in Lagos, which thrives to deliver fresh and innovative ideas in film and television productions. Odukbame received his Bachelor of Science degree in cinematography from Montana State University in the United States. Uh, in his last couple of uh, years, he has produced Mama Put, a New Direction short film, and the critically acclaimed documentary, Ibadan, Cradle of Literati. His current works include Tinsel's MN Mnet's uh, first soap opera produced in sub-Saharan Africa and his new documentary titled Bariga Boy. He's also a member of the advisory board for the School of Media and Communications, uh, Pan-African University in Nigeria. Odukbami has a professional film career and that spans over 25 years and is described to be compulsively enthusiastic about creating fact-based stories, not as a necessity but born for his educational background or harsh economic realities. His latest work documented the illustrious career of a recently departed Nigerian veteran musician known as Rolling Dollar, whose music was about journeys, philosophy, thinking, and ideal. His music demonstrated metaphoric paradigm about struggle, poverty, which he himself experienced, and the ups and downs of life in general. Fatai was born in Lagos in July of 1926. His name, Al-Haji Abdu Olayiwola Olagunju, hailed from Ede in Osun State. He got his nickname Rolling Dollar around in 1937, when Fatai would always roar a silver dollar piece at the coin toss in the football matches in his school in Nigeria, Lagos. Um, Mr. Femi, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you, and thanks for inviting me here. Yes, uh, so obviously we see that you have a career that spans over 25 years. How did you get into filmmaking? Well, I mean, I, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I think I grew up um, with influences of photography around uh, around uh, where I lived when I was growing up. Right. And I'd always wanted to, to be someone that told stories with images. And, uh, and I was very, you know, very particular about following that kind of career. Um, which, which is why I went to school, you know, I, I, I wanted to be in a film school right. to really get some professional training, which is, um, which is how it's gone, really. Okay, so at what age did you obviously decide to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do, you know, that's the path I'm taking. And when I say that, I mean, you obviously had to go and study. And I know you studied somewhere in Montana in the United States. Yes, indeed. I, I, you know, the strangest part of it was that um, where I grew up, you know, we lived in this communal kind of houses and we had an apartment upstairs, but there's a gentleman who was a photographer downstairs, the house, somewhere in the middle of Lagos Square. Right. And I always saw him uh, doing largely portraiture. Uh, but I loved the fact that people would dress up to come to him. I mean, people oh, okay. would come to the family. They would dress up in their Sunday best and they would come and he would he would manipulate the whole process. He, he mm -hmm. knew where the children had to stand, how the father needed to be. And I thought he was, he was the one in control of a story being told. He, he was the gatekeeper. And I, I think I must have been about seven or eight. And uh, I was very certain that, you know, whatever my future was, uh, there certainly was a camera somewhere in there, right. um, and for me, that's 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 been the case. You're described here as a compulsively enthusiastic uh, about f creating fact-based stories. That's quite a loaded statement in description. Compulsively, <laughs> so tell us about that. <laughs> well, I I I think that life is is more interesting than than fiction. Um, uh, there's a way in which I'm, I'm very interested in biographies and autobiographies right. because I think, you know, um, 
the narrative of lives, especially um, successful lives, mm -hmm. um, is it has has the ups and downs that have built into them a certain inspiration. Um, you know, they, they go through things that they, they, they have no idea what the future holds. Right. And so there are parts of their character that come out, uh, the values they hold come out, mm -hmm. what drives them, what passions they have come out, um, you know, in the course of trying to, to meet their ambition, to meet, you know, uh, what their purpose in life is. And so for me, um, I like to make documentaries, uh, you know, of, of people, of places, because I think uh, in the end, we learn so much more about who we are. We are more inspired uh, to be who we can be when we realize that the stories that are being told are not fiction. They're not right. something from someone's mind. There are things that actually happened. And I think that's very, very interesting, uh, especially when you see uh, a, the story of people who have come from great, impossible, difficult, challenging backgrounds, right. and yet have managed to to succeed, to yep. to to claim what their purpose is. We're going to talk about your latest uh, production, this documentary on Fatai, the Rolling yes. Dollar Man. <laughs> yeah, this was a giant in musical yes, history for sure. and he's left a legacy that's obviously not going to be matched at yeah. 87 the guy was still rocking and we've seen people like Mick Jagger yeah, Mick. I mean <laughs> people doing it in other stages somewhere but this yeah. was an African treasure and you tackled this and said I'm going to tell that story how did you approach it well, I thought he was an he was an African original. Right. Um, you know, I'd seen the I'd seen the film of the Cuban musicians before, right. and and in in some ways the stories parallel is or his story parallels theirs. Right. But I think there is something even more unique about his story. His story for me um, is about a, a passion for your talent in such a way that it is not um, merely commercial. It is not merely a talent that you, you, um, you use to make money. It was, it was, it, it, music was Fatai Rolling Dollars' bully pulpit. Right. Music was what made him tick. Mm -hmm. And for 60 years, through when he was a star and through when he was not, um, he never stopped playing music. He never stopped composing music. He never stopped um, investing in younger people, trying to create, you know, uh, the kind of sounds. And, that, and, that, and we you, believe that his uh, music influenced the late Fela. Oh, of course. He was yeah. very close to Fela Nicola Pocuti. In fact, his own um, difficult times began when Fela's house was burnt. Oh. Because he kept he had kept his own um, musical equipment in Fela's house. Oh. And he, he was constantly at Fela's house. And he had gone off to Friday uh, prayers at the mosque when the yeah, whole... He was a staunch uh, Muslim, right? He was a staunch Muslim. Mm -hmm. And and Fela's house was burnt along with his own, his own equipment and his own property. But Fela was someone that inspired um, him to, to be very involved in, in, you know, how stories were told through right. music. There is a way in which the African identity is, is transmitted and explicated through our music, principally. Right. And I think he was uh, truly a guardian of, of, of that, which, which really made him um, unique, not only for the long period of time, mm -hmm. because his music was, was evergreen, over the course of six decades and right. about three different generations. And I think that's, that's remarkable. It is indeed. So now, this was history you were documenting, because uh, this is one man who was actually born in 1929. So yeah. all these years, what? six decades, as yeah. you put it, he was doing this. You obviously, uh, according to your compulsion of 
trying to get the facts. You got the facts, and you spoke to several band members that he worked with, musicians and uh, people that know him, and they told their story. How was it for you to be in the presence of just such a legend? Well, I'd followed, I'd followed him for quite a while mm -hmm. because I, you know, I always believe that it's very difficult for you to to tell a very um, an honest story if your subject is not authentic. Right. In, 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 in his essence. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to follow, you know, the subject around a while and just to be certain in my own mind that what we're dealing with is not a created legend and that, you know, the man had earned, you know, absolutely earned the right um, to, 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 to be a subject in such right. a film. And um, so I'd followed him around for a few years and um, in that wise, I'd gotten to, to, you know, gather a lot of information and research about the story. So I'd, I'd sort of been researching the story for a couple of years. Okay. And um, the wonderful part about it is a lot of the people that played with him, who are still alive, mm -hmm. um, were very enthusiastic because they realized as well that this was also a story not just about Fatai Rolling Dollars as a person, but also about a, a, a period and a time right. in which they were, um, they had contributed. They, they, had, they had been, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the source of, of, of music and understanding their compositions, their creativity was what was, um, you know, uh, the interpretation of that time. Okay. And so they were all very eager and very, you know, uh, enthusiastic to contribute to 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 the film. There, there's a lot of uh, a lot of footage that you know I couldn't I, I didn't you know couldn't put in the film uh, because there were just so many people who wanted to to um, to tell the story with me. Okay, and I see that obviously you needed to be really patient because this was kind of like a long haul trying to gather everybody and to capture the story as it should be, as, as it was. How long did it take you? Well, the, the entire film took about two and a half years, maybe three, uh, because there was also the thread where I wanted to use the music itself um, mm -hmm. to also tell a story, i.e. a lot of the music of the time um, are no longer available for people. They're not available out there. You can't just go out there and buy some of the music of a Tyrolean dollars other than the very popular ones that he had re-released. Right. But I wanted to not only um, tell the story through, you know, his own recollections and that of, of, of his, of his uh, colleagues, but I also wanted people to experience the music of that time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it took a while to get all the music and all the rights and get everybody all signed on um, to, 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 to doing this, which is why it took maybe three years. So you, he featured, you featured, um, this instrument that he played, the thumb guitar, as they call it. Yeah, Other people Agidibo. would probably, yeah. uh, that's the Agidibo. Yes, indeed. Okay. So it was kind of, uh, a curious instrument because back in East Africa, South Africa, they have what they call the Mbira and it has Ooh. many keys. Now this one almost had like five different keys. Yes. And he was called the Odigibo father. <laughs> well, he, he was very adept at playing it. Um, he wasn't the one that created the instrument because right. the instrument was um, something that had existed before he started playing music. But he was clearly very adept at it. He was very talented at playing it. So and then he, you know, he had also introduced, um, um, he had this capacity to also not only just play the, the metals, the, the, the notes themselves, he, right. could, he was able to accompany it with something like a percussion by beating on the side. Yeah, uh, because the, back in the, the day, I would imagine that it was very difficult to fuse a traditional instrument like that because this is not really like a percussion instrument this is one of the key instruments and then fuse it with the electronic guitars 
And I mean, it's been happening now where these instruments are being amplified and everything like that. So he yeah. managed to introduce this instrument and yeah. fuse it with his music. So I felt yes. that was really something profound for anybody who loves music. Well, he, he, I thought, you know, uh, he did, he did, I think he's, uh, his contribution was that he was always very creative as, as an artist. Right. Um, he, he did not only want to, to play what was just out there, mm -hmm. he, he sought to add something to the musical conversation. And, and I think that's really what made him so unique in that over these many different generations, um, he had created the sorts of music that, you know, different generations could discover and yeah. like, you so, know. So this music, the genre of music he played, this was high life or juju music as they call it? Well, it was, it was principally juju music. In fact, it started out as what was called agitigo music. Adigo. But agitigo music, when the Spanish guitars, the guitars came, right. and amplification came. Because the uh, distinct people, sound from his music is that guitar. So I was yes, trying to figure out yes. what influence that, you know, what direction yes. it took. But it kind of like was leading the, the heart of, the, of his music. Well, yeah, because, you know, he, he was a... Um, he was a soloist in some form, you know, the, the juju music mm -hmm. um, ultimately combined a, a bit of, you know, the Spanish music, the bit of jazz, because you had all these solos um, on top of the percussion. And you had all these solos, even till today, you have solos on, on top of a rhythm section of guitars, which yeah. is really what, what juju music is. And... Um, his, uh, his dexterity with the guitar, his solos are amazing. Even at the age of 86, he's been able to, you know, combine that, that capacity with, with a great deal of showmanship. Okay. So now, as a filmmaker yourself, uh, t obviously tackling this kind of project, what message did you personally have for the fans of his music and for the consumers? Because I'm already taken after watching your work. I hardly knew much about this gentleman, but uh, I say to myself, wow, if he influenced Fela, how come Fela then went and was greater than life, you know, larger than life? And then there was this veteran, and I could tell that he was seasoned, he was comfortable, you know, in doing yes. his art. So yes. what is the message that you, as the filmmaker, would want to tell exactly? Well, the first, principally, to capture the historical contribution of this man. Right. And, and, you know, um, it's very important um, in Africa that we um, respect our heroes, whether they be in politics, in the arts, um, as musicians, or, or whatever. Um, there is a way in which the young people of Africa need inspiration. We need to understand that we also have had people of great skill, great talent, um, who have contributed in various forms to um, the story right. of, of, of Africa. And culture is something that I think is, is, is important to define identity right. in, in this globalization era. And it's so easy to celebrate great musicians from, you know, the Western Hemisphere, from the United States, from the United Kingdom. Um, and, and oftentimes the reason we're not able to celebrate our own is simply because we have no information. We right. have not been able to capture their story in a way that, you know, our generations, that you know, succeeding generations can appreciate and consume. And I, that was my first reason for making this. Okay. Uh, but deeper than that is the fact that this man is a true artist. True. Today, you have a lot of performers, but very few artists. You're you have right. a lot of celebrities or celebrity, um, you know, red carpet animals um, right. whose <laughs> skills and talent mm -hmm. uh, will not stand the test of time. There is something in the story of Atai Rolling Dollars that says um, you earn your celebrity, really. You ought to earn your stripes. You, you, you earn it 
by paying attention to your to, to, to your to your craft, by practicing, by by being innovative, by being creative, and you know, by being out there, come rain or sunshine. Right. There is something that is very compelling for me about the story. Um, this was a guy who had been a star, a big star, and then had fallen on very difficult times. And right. ultimately ended up being, um, uh, you know, a gate man, a guard in a, in a stadium where right. they were, right. you know, doing a construction. And every evening where, I mean, it had come to a time where nobody knew who he was. And he still went to that work as a god every night, carrying his guitar. And he practiced all night long. This was after he had been a star for about 20 years prior to that. Wow. So, to me, the fact that he had a second, um, a second chance, a second comeback, uh, a second, you know, shot at celebrity, um, is important because your chance when it comes, comes because you're ready. Right. There is a way in which people think that opportunity um, will come to you if you just pray. Well, opportunity <laughs> will come to you if you get ready, if you, if, you, if, you, if you work hard, so that when it comes, you recognize it. Okay. And I think that's, that's very important um, part of the story, and what I think is, is, is his greatest legacy to this a uh, young generation of, of artists. Yeah, so now I think it's also important that uh, you, as obviously a fellow Nigerian, uh, would tell that story because we've had ethnomusicologists come through from Europe and find this uh, African musician who's obviously not known on the stages of the international world and uh, try to interpret what they believe he's saying in his music, especially if he's singing in his local vernacular. So I feel that connection in how you told that story and you obviously understand the intricacies of even his language, of his mannerism, his behavior, his surroundings, his upbringing, his pain, you see, so you connected. So I felt like uh, this was a job well done you know, and uh, I just like to appreciate. Uh, I, 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 when I viewed the, the 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 film, I said, "Wow, it's 51 minutes. Am I going to sit and watch something about somebody I don't know whose music I don't connect with completely?" So it captivated me, and just to see how you patched up and framed it and put it together, uh, to me was a historical musical lesson. So. We'd like to say uh, thank you very much for that job well done. Now, in closing, is there anything that you'd probably want to say to some aspiring filmmakers like yourself, younger, hopefully, who should get that inspiration that you received that you can share? Well, I think it's important that we understand that documentaries are very critical um, to development, they're very critical to our our story. They're very critical to our identity right. um, as Africans, as as Nigerians, um, because documentaries in this age of fast food and fast news and and everything moving so fast, right. um, you can't quite get the truth of anything from the evening news anymore. We need to get to a place where we understand that documentaries themselves are political instruments for mm -hmm. defining um, a, a way forward, economically, socially. Um, it's really a critical form of, of artistic expression. And for a country like Nigeria, and for a lot of countries in Africa who have similar you know, experiences as, as Nigeria, uh, Capturing the essence mm -hmm. of, of our culture and our heroes in these in this cultures and, and what you call, you know, the African experience is critical to our capacity to even understand it. Right. And I think that's, that's really, really, really um, why I am eager to constantly, you know, uh, make these stories and, and capture this, this, um, this 
heroes in these times and this, these experiences, uh, because in another hundred years, um, telling the story of Africa cannot continue to be something that is told uh, by people from outside of the experience, right. which is what we've had for the last hundred years. Right. Anyway, so in closing, I said that before already, but in closing, um, how did he die? What the, the illness is Well, unknown. I mean, you know, he, 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 the, the, the amazing thing is that Fatai Rolling Dollars um, was a performing artist till the day that. He had right. just come back from a, a musical tour in the U.S. And, which was um, a few weeks you know, ago, according to our records here. Which was just a few weeks ago. Yeah. And, you know, came back and, you know, supposedly wasn't feeling very well. And, uh, you know, the rest is, is, is history now. It's history, um, as they say. But I, I am really excited about the fact that, you know, uh, until the day he died, he, he lived um, on stage. He lived to provide uh, music to, 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 to people, to... To, to play right. this music uh, to people across the world. He was a man who, um, who, who added a lot to our lives, and, and he is he, really, really to be mourned and, and, and celebrated. I see even the president actually paid tribute to his, you know, to his passing. He says the guitarist and singer had enthralled the teeming followers during a career of more than 64 years. That was President Jonathan. Anyway, thank you very much. This is uh, thank you. Femi. I'm trying to... Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. So that was Femi, and he was talking about his new film, a documentary about the late Rolling Dollar, a veteran musician from Nigeria who actually passed away a few weeks ago. And uh, the film is called Rolling Dollar Unplugged. So stay tuned. We have more programming.